Good morning. I'm the executive director of the Hamilton Woodtype and Printing Museum, and for the uh, first three years of the job, that also meant I was the executive janitor, uh, the executive electrician. Um, I was the only employee. Maybe six or seven years ago, um, I was working as a sales and marketing manager for a commercial printing firm in Green Bay, Wisconsin, where I grew up. Um, now, I have been a printer my entire life, working in my dad and my grandfather's shop, so I have been at this for a long time. Um, so when I was asked to leave that, you know, relatively comfortable paying eight to five job to take a position as the director of the Woodtype Museum, which you see there in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, the U.S. economy had pretty much just uh, collapsed. And uh, the museum that I was asked to take over was sort of on the brink itself. I would be replacing the only employee that the museum had. Uh, the year before, they had not taken in enough money to cover even one quarter of that person's salary. So existing inside the walls of one of three blocks of this entire factory that was still operating, they had made all of America's wood type for the printing industry, you know, the headlines of America for nearly 100 years. The place, well, it sort of leaked. You know, it had gone from being a relatively modest operation back in 1880 to an incredibly successful operation in this tiny little town. And so what you're looking at is a crew from the very early years, and they expanded at such a rate, so dominating the U.S. printing industry that um, they just kept expanding and expanding. And, you know, when you think of what that was applied to, it was everything that we communicate to each other with in the day. You know, whether that was billboard or newspaper, book or pamphlet or poster, they were producing the wood type uh, that was used for the print industry. And so you had this uh, incredible company that had sort of morphed into a monster and came to dominate not just the area, but the country. It's time kind of came and went, and uh, over time, uh, from being the Hamilton Manufacturing Company, uh, it was taken over by a large conglomerate. Things were kind of going downhill. So uh, what I was taking over was a place that occasionally leaked badly. Sometimes you had heat in the winter, that was kind of a bonus. The plumbing, not so good, maybe more short circuits than you could shake an extension cord at. It all existed in a town with a declining population as manufacturing sort of uh, drifted away uh, and the factory that I was in seeming to be the next on the list. So, you know, I, uh, I wandered around and looked at the sort of condition of the place and what I was going to be getting myself into and I thought, what's not to like, you know? <laughs> um, it was a marvelous place, I thought. Having been in the print industry, it, you know, it needed a little work. You know, obviously there was that to it. It was interesting. The, a question was posed to me by a friend at about the same time. And it was, what kind of art would you make if you had all the money in the world? Well, I didn't really care for that question. It didn't really seem like something I would ever face. I thought the real question is, what kind of art would you make if you had absolutely no money at all? It seemed more likely the sort of thing that I would face. You know, despite the fact that the museum had nearly no visitors during the winter months, uh, a handful of the rest of the year, and uh, kind of seemed to be off the beaten path for just about anybody, it seemed like uh, a most marvelous place to me. It holds the world's largest collection of wood type and related equipment, and it, in a sense, was a working museum, meaning we made the type, we repaired the presses, uh, we taught people how to use them, and we printed with it. So it was a working museum in that fullest sense, uh, at least in theory. The problem was the place didn't work. There was one thing I knew how to do, and that was print. So I did what printers do, you know. I learned to set type at age 10, so um, you put on your apron and, and you look for a can of ink. So using that marvelous type, I began putting posters together and, you know, merely creating a product that the museum could utilize and to indicate what they were doing. So between the type blocks that we had and the... Um, wonderful collection of old 
printing blocks, I began to create posters. Those of you who are native of Chicago might be interested to know that these were all actually from the Globe Printing Company out of Chicago. So from the, say, 1920s to the 1970s, um, they produced these pieces, and it seemed to me that I was coming up with these fascinating stories that backed up the blocks, whether it was finding out what the Royal American shows were as a circus that traveled the country. The Asylum of Horrors is actually about full size. And then you read that Frankenstein's actually on stage. And you think, well, what was that like? You know, it's a wonderful way of, of telling the, the history of the United States, which I think is what printing does. American printing is American history. So the football poster actually is signed. Normally the artist doesn't get to be that specific with the work. They are very much anonymous, but because the author of that poster, um, I believe had illustrated all of his uncle's Tarzan books, so uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' nephew, you began to discover a lot of things about the, the sort of fabric of the country. So then we started to play with the other blocks. So I began making posters out of combinations of posters, obviously rodeo, rodeo is just maybe an example of my own bad sense of humor. Um, <laughs> auto racing did not go together, but it sure seemed to in my mind, and then we put together our own sort of pinup girl poster with a type at the bottom to keep your interest. So, um, <laughs> now there was another thing that, that I, I could do in addition to, you know, just sort of illustrating the collection as a means of extending it to a greater audience. The museum, you know, began to uh, take a little more shape. Now, you know, a working museum obviously is a wonderful thing because it, in a sense, it's a museum within context. And I think that by nature and by necessity, most museums are, in a sense, out of context, right? The artifacts that they bring into them are intended for the use of those people that view them, but essentially at a distance. And what I wanted to do was to create a space where you were very much an active part of it, not only because printing type is a much more of an active piece of equipment than an illustration in a frame on a wall. You can take that type and reuse it and reuse it. So it's, it's got that similarity to me in that you can pick up an old guitar and play a new song, right? This 12,000 square foot plant was home and, you know, despite its drawbacks, it seemed like just a wonderful place that you could engage people. So we went from having a few posters on the wall to creating a little bit of a company store, if you will, and then the creation of a website uh, with a store attached to it. You know, and you have to remember that when you are dealing with uh, a hierarchy in, in a small town, uh, there is that need even to remind them that a website is probably a good thing. So there, there are those political things that you probably need to do to sort of grease the wheels, so to speak. But anyway, what we then did is begin to create workshops and allow people to come in and interact with the type. And so it became this marvelous way for college students and graphic designers um, architectural firms, you know, college faculty to come in and, and to use the space and to make their own impressions. So our interns came from anywhere around the world, eventually, Italy or England, to use the collection. In some cases, all they really wanted to see was a piece of hard rock maple cut into an ampersand. And that too speaks to the whole advantage of a working museum, the idea that Hamilton so dominated their industry that all the competition was basically gone by 1900. What that means is we basically um, have some of the only people who know about the, the process. This 89-year-old gentleman, Nor Brilski, is sort of our rock star of type cutters, being one of the only people in the country who actually knows how to do this from a historic standpoint. So the other, Mardell Dubeck, is actually the world's greatest type cutter. Now, there's not a lot of competition, right? You know, there, so, so it's not like the, the, there's a top 10 list. But still, the, you know, the point was what 
I was attempting to do is to incorporate uh, those people who had worked at the plant and what it had come into so that not only would we be illustrating printing, but we would be doing it with the people who had worked there, merge them with those who simply wanted to come and work. So whether that was workshop or volunteer, we had people who were coming in and trying to make it work. I did not do this alone, right? I think that's why it worked. It wasn't as though I had an idea that I could put into place. The whole idea is that you engage as many people as possible and allow them uh, to become a, a part of the place. So in my case, my initial help came from my brother Bill, who's a fine printer and uh, designer as well. So I made him my artistic director and he built our website and does a lot of wonderful printing for us as well. Knowing that we could certainly not answer all of the questions, um, not just printing related, but uh, museum and operations related. We hired an artistic board of scholars and friends from across the country who would allow us to sort of weigh in on those matters that presented themselves to us. I then moved on to the point of creating a, a position of artist in residence. My initial one was a graphic design instructor from Indiana University named Paul Brown. Um, one of those few people who simply came to the museum from time to time just to help out, just to volunteer. And then, of course, occasionally he would bring student groups and we would work together on a variety of things, both for their knowledge of, of the print industry and, and ours as well. Now, finally, we were aided by a documentary produced by Kartemkin Films out of Chicago called Typeface. So, in a sense, um, it began to seem like I had kind of come on at the right time. The visitors began to grow. This is a Waze Goose. For those of you who do not know about uh, a Waze Goose, in a sense, well, my dictionary says that it's basically a printer's gathering. Um, it also calls FDR the new president, so, you know, the information's a little, little old, but traditionally it was basically an end-of-year event where printers got together and either prepared the studio for winter or the print shop. In our case, it's a, it's a weekend workshop um, of, of people that come to the museum and basically talk all things type. I had uh, done something else based on the advice of an intern in that first year. What I was told was um, that I should have a Facebook page. And, you know, uh, okay, I'm a letterpress printer, so there's a lot of me that is Luddite by nature. And, and the idea that, you know, I, I should be Twittering when I was not even capable of a small chirp um, seemed that, you know, I don't know. So, but I gave it a try. And one of the things that I began to notice is that those attendees at the museum, and particularly of the workshops, were people roughly between the 25 to 40 year old range. So that there was an audience that, that seemed to be emerging that was not quite the traditional history museum audience. So on a winter's day, a couple months later, I wandered around the museum through the factory, kind of out of uh, our realm into those industrial areas and took photographs and posted them on, on the Facebook page. And uh, by morning, a thousand people had seen that post and about 2,000 by the following day. So, you know, this idea of social media um, in conjunction with, with a printing museum uh, certainly seemed to have legs. It became sort of a wonderful way that we could engage that further audience because what I realized is that those people that were visiting the, uh, the page were certainly from Wisconsin and Illinois, but they were from uh, Washington and Argentina and Arkansas and a lot of places in between. So the existence of the virtual visitor had kind of a wonderful gravity to me and that realization that uh, I also needed to take care of the friends that I had not met. Few museums have an opportunity to keep their patrons in the space for longer than, oh, I would say one to two hours, you know, maybe a little bit longer. But between workshops and things like that, we have the capability to have people in the museum for eight hours at a time. And, you know, that close interaction in teaching people how to do things and demonstrating the presses meant that they were no longer visitors, they were becoming friends. and. Uh, they were returning, 
And so, you know, this wonderful opportunity where it seemed like we were making friends, we weren't growing the museum. Type designer Matthew Carter presenting at one of our conferences here was pretty great. So we ran this fall conference, this Ways Goose, the first year and barely had enough people to break even. But the museum continued to grow and it grew to the point where um, a little over two years ago, I hired an assistant director. And, uh, you know, that, that was an amazing thing. I know perhaps to you that means one more person in the building, but to me it was the doubling of the workforce, right? <laughs> um, so it was a big deal. It is not so surprising that uh, Stephanie, my assistant director, came from Indiana University and was a student of my artist in residence. You know, I mean, uh, in a sense, I kind of felt like I was hiring from within. The museum is growing and everything seems like it's going to work and, and we may someday actually make money. And we are continuing onward and, and the classes and, and the visitors are increasing. So um, we began to offer more programming and, and add exhibits and things like that almost a year ago. Um, we were preparing for the conference. It was two to three days away. And I was summoned into the office of the main plant. So, you know, you'd kind of run your way through the museum through what was sort of left of it. It was still an operating plant, but, you know, a few less people operating the place than had previously been. So I made my way, you know, two blocks down through the building to the main office, you know, sort of like being called into the principal's office, I felt. You know, it was never good when those people wanted to talk to you. Now, the Hamilton plant had sort of morphed into much more of a global-owned place, the, you know, as is common in the country. So their headquarters were somewhere completely different, but um, what that means, though, is the decisions that they make are made a long way from you, and you are not really in their mind when they make them. So what I was told at that meeting was that the products made in this 12 and a half acre plant were actually moving to their locations around the country and I had five months to pack and move out. So, so much for the historic home of the museum. I guess in all fairness, I have to say that the, the company did basically give us free rent for most of the time we were there. You know, it's a marvelous thing and I think it's probably the reason why we actually were able to succeed, you know, because there was that bill that we simply didn't have to pay. But the problem there is, is uh, that double-edged sword. You know, in a small town, particularly like Two Rivers, you are controlled by the historical society. And what this meant, though, is that there were no deep pockets to bail us out, you know, no rainy day slush fund, no foundation to come through and um, to provide us with a place to, to go to. So suddenly that question of how to create art with no money was becoming even more, more valid. So, you know, what they were essentially saying is all of these people who are making all of these things will no longer be in the building, nor will you. You know, we needed funds, we needed a building, and we needed the means to move 35,000 square feet of museum and storage into a yet unknown location. You know, I've moved my house and I have moved printing equipment, but I, I was not at all prepared for this sort of thing. Much of our collection was not cataloged and the majority of the storage was packed in what I would call old-time printer's fashion, which basically meant when you got a press that, that was uh, broken, you shoved it into a corner and when you got the next press, you simply pushed it in front, you know. So it was going to be difficult. Um, we didn't truly know what we had. We were thinking, well, we can't just shut the place down, right? Um, we'd need to organize event. We'd kind of need to organize ourselves and figure something out. But, you know, with a conference to run, we could not think too much about that. So at the end of our conference, I announced to the audience, I, I, you know, I explained the situation that we were running into and, uh, and, and what was going to happen. And it was sort of like, you know, turning on the, that small faucet in hopes of watering a large field. But um, the donations came in, you know, from Sheboygan, Wisconsin to Serbia. And so the volume of people um, that had spread the word about us just sort of had that viral effect that um, began to make us think that there may be a way to move out. But, the thing is you still had to do it. 
And so there was the dismantling of the whole place and the packing up. You know, we weren't really sure quite how that would go. It's not as though you can hire somebody to tell you how to move the world's largest collection of, of type. Uh, we did what made the most sense to us. We measured it, mapped it, marked it. Instead of asking people to sign up for printing workshops, we asked them to sign up for packing crews. We counted every piece of equipment, you know, the tables, the presses, the cutters, the linotypes, the skids of wood, the cans of ink and drawer after drawer after drawer of type. With the help of a local trucking firm, we actually found a means to move it. I had estimated roughly 17 semis would be enough to pack all of this stuff up. Okay, so I was off by 10 semis, you know. Um, <laughs> I did learn to run a forklift quite well. You know, there, there were those uh, setbacks along the way as we were sort of amassing the collection. Well, the fact that in a town of 10,000, there are only so many buildings that can house a museum of our size. And after days of searching, we, we, we had found a place, but it was going to need work. And obviously, we had to get all of this stuff out of the old place and move it into the new. By May 1st, we actually had a location and we got everything in. The crews that helped out sort of came from, you know, across the country and this is sort of one of many, many groups that would just sort of come in and, you know, wrap things in shrink wrap and, and bubble wrap. And so the, uh, the place that we found, a former manufacturing plant about a half a mile from our old location, is the home of the new museum. It's going to need some work. Well, no, it's going to need a lot of work. Um, some of the rooms, you know, are less than ideal. This is actually the retail store of the new museum, so you can, I know you can see the potential, you know, it, it, it's there, right? I do know what it's like to unload 27 semis of equipment, mostly with one or two people, but we continue onward. And, and while we can't be open to the public, we can engage them, whether they are the former employees uh, of the now closed factory or those people who were fans of the museum uh, as we begin to prepare the new space. Slowly, we're finding a way to sort of engage the town to sort of help us preserve their place in history that six generations of their family and friends had worked. And so, you know, it slowly comes together. This weekend, we will have yet another group you know, this room is now packed. There is no more room to move. So, you know, you can sort of see what happens over time. So they'll help us move it out. And, you know, uh, while our, our future may be a little bit uncertain, we will hold our fifth Ways Goose in about a month and we'll bring those people back from near and far. And they'll come because they've helped and they'll be coming because they're curious. While many of them will be there for the first time, they've watched our progress and they've been a part of it. So we don't think of them as visitors, you know, or attendees. I think what, what we hope is that they will come back as friends. And when they do, we'll open the doors and uh, say, welcome back. We've been waiting for you. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>